<clears throat> Safety and security, I think, are important to everyone here. We want to be safe in our homes. You know, we put alarm systems in there, and door locks and all that kind of thing. We want to be safe. We want to be safe in our cars as we travel, in the ocean as we swim, in the mountains as we hike. We want to be safe. We want to be secure. We want to be secure in our jobs, secure in our relationships. We want to be secure financially. And we want to be secure knowing that we are in good health. And we don't have something growing in our bodies that will eventually take over and take us out. Right? We all want to be healthy. Uh, it was about um, almost two weeks ago. Heather went in to the, doc to the doctors because she, she was having a pain, sharp pain in her stomach. And she had tests done at our general doctor, and uh, they found something. And they found a, a complex cyst on one of her ovaries. And uh, so there was a lot of question after that, whether it was cancer. So for, you know, 10 days, we're walking around and just trying to keep things together, having to trust God. And it was just so easy for the mind to wander around and, and think about this and that if this were the case. And uh, tears were, you know, coming at a drop of a hat. Um, and uh, so we go Thursday to the doctor and uh, to the gynecologist and uh, he does his exam and all that kind of thing. And uh, he's pretty sure that it's not cancer, but they're gonna have to take him out. And that's gonna happen on July the one. But we left that day after that, that news um, with a sigh of relief and uh, still some things to come but you know this is why I chose this text because personally we were dealing with it and uh, and you know it was so easy for the mind to wander and, and think about this or that and had to reel it in and remind ourselves of who God was that we were in his hands that he is a strong tower where our, ultimately, where our ultimate safety lies. And that's a reality. That's true. <clears throat> that was our, you know, rea our, our reality check. But every day, all the time, there are reminders that we live in a very unsafe world. The days of COVID. Uh, the war in the Ukraine. First name hurricane of the season. We have tornadoes, uh, the mass shooting in Evaldi, Texas, uh, the accidents that you drive by, you know, when, you're, when you go into work on 85 or some other place. Accidents happen all the time. And you're driving by and go, I guess that could have been me. <clears throat> all these things and more, and the list goes on and on, scream, unsafe, insecure. It's so easy for us to draw that conclusion from those events. You know, and, and the reason why there are uh, danger, why there is danger and threats and all these things is, you know, because Adam went up against God. He defied him. He went his own way and he sinned and he sunk us all. And as soon as that happened, whew, the world was flooded, not only with sin, but the creation was cursed. So you have the hurricanes and the tornadoes, and you have all the other things in life that are threatening 
that pose danger. And so our whole soldier, from the time we enter to the time we die, has these threats and these dangers before us. Now, God knows that, doesn't he? I mean, he's, he knows all things. And he's a father who loves you. I mean, after all, I mean, he sent his son to deal with your greatest threat, and that's eternal hell and damnation. He sent his son to provide forgiveness of sin, to grant you eternal life. And that screams, you might say, or maybe not screams, but sings loudly. He cares. He's compassionate. He knows our frame. <clears throat> well, all throughout the Bible, um, he speaks words of con confidence, things that, words that provide security and safety for us, that reminds us of his care. And one such passage is the one that I read earlier. Uh, both the, the Matthew, the, the Mark passage when Jesus is in the boat. Um, that's true. I mean, he is in the boat with us as we go through this world. And then the passage from Proverbs. The name of the Lord is a strong or a fortified tower. The righteous, you, run to it and are safe. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. That's God speaking to you this morning, telling you that he, basically, the Lord God, is your source of ultimate safety and security. <clears throat> He specifically says, the writer to the Proverbs says, the name of the Lord, um, the righteous run into it and find safety. So the, the concept of name is pretty big. The name of the Lord, okay? So what does that mean? You know, when you and I talk about names, you know, we're talking about identification. Um, hi, I'm Bill Slattery. I'm the pastor of Redeemer. Nice to meet you. And then the other person tells me their name, so they know me, I know you. I see your name, there's Dave, there's Paul, there's Mary, there's Betty Jane. I've identified you, I know who you are by virtue of your name. And the concept of name functioned like that in, in the ancient Hebrew culture, but it, it did a lot more, it meant a lot more back then. The, a name's to them, spoke to something about the person to whom it was given. You know, when, when God changed Abraham, Abram's name to Abraham, it was because Abraham was going to be the father of many nations, and that's what the name meant. That's how names functioned back then. So with reference to the many names of God, they expressed something about him, his person, his character, his attributes. They are descriptions of who he is and what he is like as a person. It's a, it's a convenient means of helping you and I when we think of this name of God. Oh, that's what it means. It's shorthand, so to speak. And what God would do at times is that when, when, when one of his people were going through a, a specific situation, heart event or a challenge, he would speak to them according to that name. He would use a certain name uh, to help them. Think of Abraham. He was told when he was 99 years of age, I'm going to make you into a great nation, which all the peoples of the world will be blessed by. And then if you read the Genesis account in, in Genesis 17 and elsewhere, he struggles with that. He's perplexed. Really? That's going to happen? I mean, I'm old. I'm mean, 99. And you're going to give me a son, and you're going to bless all the nations through me, and my seed? I don't know. He struggled. He was human. And then God gave him one of his names. God told him that I am El Shaddai. 
which means God Almighty, the mighty provider. And so the takeaway for Abraham that day or that, at that time was, okay, I couldn't pull this off by myself, but El Shaddai, the Almighty One, He can pull it off. It's His will. He's revealed it. And because of His mighty power and mighty will, it's going to happen. That was the takeaway for Abraham. There are many names of God, and we can't sort through them all today. But let's just consider a few of them. Take the designated name, the proper name of God, the Lord. Remember the time when Moses was being called by God in Exodus chapter 3. Um, God speaks to him, the Lord speaks to him uh, in a bush that was on fire. It wasn't disintegrating anything, but it, you know, it was a, a bush that was on fire, and the Lord spoke to Abraham through that bush, in that bush. And, you know, he says, Abraham, I want you to, to lead my people out of Egypt. And, uh, you know, uh, Moses thinks about that, and, you know, he just questions once again, well, can I pull this off? And uh, what, if, what do I say to the people? And he says, say that I am sent you. Yahweh the Lord sent you. And then Moses, you know, begins and charts off, charts off to do his, what God has called him to do. <clears throat> but that's when we learn about the name Lord officially, the proper name of God. And in that passage are some things that you learn. You learn, obviously, that the Lord is a person. He talks to Moses. He's a holy person. He tells Moses, right, when he was in the presence of, on the, by the burning bush, take off your sandals. You are on holy ground. So the Lord is a holy person. He's completely set apart from sin. He's transcendent, high and lifted up, enthroned in the heavens, not the slightest taint of sin in his person. It's pure, pure holiness. And also, he's the head of a covenant. That's why he was showing up. He made a promise, a covenant to Abraham. God heard the people crying. He had said it was going to be a long time, and uh, 400 plus years go by. He hears the cries of his people. It, he responds to that, addresses Moses, you're going to lead the people out. Now, John Frame, a professor that I had in seminary, I think I've mentioned this kind of thing to you before. In his studies, he, have, he has found that there are three major attributes of God that, that, that go with the name Yahweh, the name Lord, in its control, authority, and presence. Control. That speaks to the fact that the Lord is sovereign and, and mighty. And if you think about the Exodus account, you see the Lord. The name appears throughout. And what is he doing? He's manifesting his sovereign control and power. I mean, he delivers this mass of people under the leadership of Moses out of Egypt and into the promised land. And of course, you have the plagues that happened before all that. And then, you, and, and as you go through the rest of Scripture, you realize that, you know, the Lord, the Sovereign One, who is mighty in power, displays that control. We just got through Romans 8, where we, we went across the passage, God works all things, after, God works all things together for, for His people. That's the Lord, sovereignly working. Because he planned all things as the Lord, he works all things out as the Lord for the good of his people. You take, um, you know, the, uh, our first day and our last day. Uh, Psalm 139, 13 says, You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. 
your eyes saw my unformed body. All days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. That's the Lord your God who is in control of all things. The reason why you were conceived and then delivered from your mother is because of, of God, because of God's control, ultimately. And the reason why you will one eventually depart from this life and go through the next to be with God is because of, of God's will, God's control. The God that you know, the Lord God that you know, controls all things, all things. He controls all the days of your life. Of course, he's a good God, and he works all things together for your good, right? You know, as Paul thought about, you know, God's control, his sovereignty, working all things out and all that kind of thing, this is how he ends uh, Romans 11. He says, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him, through him, for him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. That was Paul's response to a big and sovereign God. So that's God's control. That's a doctrine that you all know. His authority is another attribute of his lordship. That means that the, Lord's abs has, the Lord's is in absolute authority over you and me. He has the right to tell you, as the Lord, how to live your life. And that our obligation as his servants is to, by faith, trust and obey him. He's the Lord. He's the boss. He's the ruler with a capital R. And so when he speaks and when he expresses his will in the scriptures, that's the Lord, the one who has absolute authority to tell you and me how to live. And our response as Christians who have been given faith is to trust him and obey we shouldn't challenge him, shouldn't question, we should obey him. He's the Lord. And then the, the final attribute of the Lordship of Christ is his presence. The covenant slogan speaks to the presence of the Lord. The covenant slogan that you see all throughout Scripture, even in the book of Revelation at the end of it all. I will be your God and you will be my people. That's speaking about, you know, the fact that God has taken you unto himself. And he, he is your God and you are his people. That's a relationship that's personal. He is God with us. He dwells with us. He will never leave us or forsake us. He works in us, enabling us to submit because he is present and involved and personally present in our lives. He helps us to submit to his control and to God's authority. So when you think of the, the name Lord, you ought to think, man, the Lord is a strong tower. He controls all things. He has ultimate authority to, to direct my life. And that great transcendent being who has such control over the entire universe is personally present in me, in the person of the Spirit. And he enables me to believe and to trust him to submit to his sovereignty and the events that he brings into our lives and to obey his authority. The Lord is a strong tower. Take the name Jehovah Jireh. You know what that means? What? Say it louder. The Lord will provide. Exactly. The Lord who provides. Abraham again. Genesis 22. God has told him, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son. Son of promise, Isaac. He had waited forever. Finally came. He'd grown up. Now I want you to offer him up. 
It was a test. And so Abraham, based on the, the Genesis narratives and Hebrews chapter 11, he, he doesn't bat an eye. He, he goes to bed, wakes up the next morning, and off he goes with his son Isaac. They gathered all that they needed, and they went, on their, went to where they were supposed to go, Mount Moriah. Prepared him, placed his son on this altar, and was about to sacrifice, and God says, stop, stop. Now I know that you fear the Lord. And then what did God do? The Lord provided a substitute, provided a ram, and then Abraham said, I will name this place the Lord, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. He's no different today. He is the one who provides everything that we need for life and godliness. And of course, ultimately he provided his son to meet the greatest need that we had through his death and resurrection. The Lord of hosts. You've got to think of David at this point. David is a young man and uh, and the people of God are being challenged by the Philistines. And, uh, and David hears about it, and he finds out what's going on, and there's this big giant, right, challenging the people of God. Bring someone to fight against me! Well, David takes the challenge, not in a proud, arrogant way, by no means, but because he believed in the Lord of hosts. Let me read this to you. Let me put my glasses on. <laughs> yeah, I know. David said to the Philistine, to Goliath, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the har armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and, to the whole world will, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you, all of you into our hands. So David wasn't cocky. He wasn't proud. Oh yeah, I'll take you on. That's not what he was doing. He had a relationship with the Lord. He was the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies of heaven. And he had confidence in, in the Lord. And so he went and he was successful. The Lord used him to bring down Goliath. He knew the name of the Lord. And it made a difference in what he was able, how he saw the situation. And then the courage that he had to step forward and be a servant of the Lord in that situation. And then finally, the name Jesus. That means what? Anybody? Savior. That's why the angel told his parents, name him Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins. That name meant something. It told you what Jesus was going to do. What he came into the world to do. This is why the Lord is spoken of as a strong tower. And there are many other names that we can look at, but just take those names. That's why he's a strong tower. And if, that is, if, if the names of God and what they tell you about God are going to be something that provide you with ongoing strength and confidence in the midst of all the threats and dangers, what are you going to have to do? 
you're going to have to regularly familiarize yourself with these descriptions of God and see his, these names dis, um, and how they show up on the pages of Scripture in the narratives where you see the Lord at work, the Lord of hosts at work, Jesus dying on a cross, saving us from our sins. We need to know these names and we need to know these descriptions, familiarize ourselves with them so that we can bring them to bear upon the threats and dangers that we experience that challenge us inwardly and make us feel, cause us to feel weak and despondent and, and overcome with anxiety and fear. Jesus the Lord is a strong tower for you and I to run to. Now God doesn't always, because God is who he says he is in the scriptures, things that I've said and others, doesn't mean that, that you're not harmed. Doesn't mean that you don't get sick and have things growing in your body. Doesn't mean that you might not get in an accident, right? That's not the, that, that's not the takeaway. Those things do happen in the providence of God. Sometimes God in his providence, you know, causes you to take a right instead of a left. And if you would have taken the left, you would have been in the accident. I mean, you've had those situations. I mean, God does that. But he doesn't always do that. So don't think that it means that you'll never be sick. No, that's not going to be the way it is until the new heavens and a new earth. In that world, there aren't going to be any threats. There aren't going to be any dangers. You will always be fully confident in your relationship with God, and you will always be at peace. But short of that, at this time, you're going to face the dangers and the threats. What does uh, the writer say that we need to do? We need to run into the strong tower. So that, we're, so that we experience the safety designed, that we're designed to experience. How do you run it? What, what are you talking about? Well, the writer says a righteous person must run to the Lord to find security. The righteous person is someone who has trusted Christ as Savior, has been forgiven and declared righteous, and out of that righteous standing, then seeks to live in a manner consistent with the Word of God lives a righteous life. That's the whole package. That person runs to the Lord in and, and the strong tower and finds safety. Well, the concept of uh, the strong tower, it's a, it's a metaphorical way of saying you must wholeheartedly trust in the name of the Lord and who and what the Lord is as God, which has been revealed for you in the words of the Lord found in the scriptures. So, thus I was saying, it, it just takes something that needs to be a natural part of our lives, regular part of our lives, where we are familiarizing ourselves, learning for the first time, going back over and over again, remembering who the Lord is, reading the narratives of Scripture, seeing God display who He is in the Exodus and other things, and at the cross. Praying in response to that, and then in faith, moving forward from that. Now, we are tempted at times to walk by sight and not by faith. We don't consider the names of the Lord and receive the kind of comfort. We, we, we walk by sight rather than by faith, and that's when we get ourselves into trouble. You think the example that, that um, the writer gives us in... Um, Verse 11, he says, the wealth of the rich is their fortified city. <clears throat> they imagine it a wall too high to scale. So the wealthy guy here is someone who says, you know, my security really is in all the money that I have. I've got a lot. And he imagine, imagines it as, as a high tower where he's, where he's entirely safe from, you know, the armies or anything else. And it's in his imagination because it's just not true. That guy is going to get sick and die. And his wealth is not going to do anything to shield him from that. It's all in his imagination. 
His confidence was in something temporal and earthly. That's where we go wrong. And we're all tempted to do that, and we've done it, including your pastor. It's when we place our ultimate refuge in something earthly and temporal. Um, a big one is human relationships. They're important. You know, we, we, we need, real, God made us to have relationships. He does say, love one another. So relationships are part of the deal. In good, sound relationships, family and otherwise, provide a measure of uh, security and, and uh, um, safety in some sense, right? Uh, but never in an ultimate sense. People die. People get cheesed at you and they say, I don't want to be your friend anymore. Uh, you know, marriages break up. Relationships are great. Value them. But don't value them more than you value the ultimate eternal relationship that you have with God. He is the ultimate source of your security and safety, not human relationships. Health and fitness. It's good to be healthy, you know, to do something about things, you know, eat right and, you know, do a vegan diet. Oh, no, 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 I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but, you know, to take care of yourself and do some exercise, eat right and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, go to the gym or whatever. You can do that. That's good to do that. There's some wisdom in that. Um, <clears throat> go to the doctor and get your checkups on a regular basis. All those things are good. That's wisdom. And there's a measure of uh, earthly security and, and uh, safety that come with that kind of thing. But, I mean, you can be the healthiest person on the planet. You can go to the doctors, but, you know, but you get sick. You know, cancer does show up. So it can't be where you place your ultimate trust. Your ultimate trust needs to be in the name of the Lord. He's the only eternal being there is. He's got your life in his hands. So our trust needs to be in him. There has to be a real work that we do, where we do place our minds on what God has revealed about himself in the Bible, understand it, and then appropriate it and live in light of it. God is our ultimate security. It's not relationships. It's not health and fitness. It's not food. It's not a well-ordered family, obedient children. Um, all those eventually disappoint, disappoint because it's all earthly and temporal. It crumbles after a while. Jeremiah speaks to this. He says about the, you know, the person who you know, um, trusts in the earthly and temporal. He says, this is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. That's where you end up if you place all your eggs in the basket of the earthly and temporal. You dry up. That just can't sustain what you need. Only the Lord can. And that's why Isaiah goes on to say, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord whose confidence is in him, they will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes, when the suffering comes, when the things that threaten and overwhelm come. No, it does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. When you're connected to Christ and your heart is centered on him and upon how, what he's revealed himself to be, when we trust him, when we bank on him, then all these earthly things can go wrong, but you can have the joy of the Lord. You can be growing as a Christian when all the you know, things are happening. You can be growing and joyful because you've centered your life 
your thoughts, your heart on the eternal God. And he always comes through when that's the case. So I urge you, as I got to talk to myself, run to the Lord. He's a strong tower. He's, the, you, he's where your safety lies. Trust him. And with a quote from my father-in-law, and this is what he says, the only safe place to be in life or in death is in the shadow of the Almighty One. That's the point. Father, thank you. Thank you for directing our lives. Thank you for making yourself a refuge, a place where we can find protection in this fallen world. Forgive us when we, you know, get distracted, when we think and place our thoughts and our attention on the earthly and the temporal to a point where it breaks down because it was never designed to be an ultimate place for safety and security. It's got to be you. Help us, Lord. Yes, help us to be responsible and all, but help us to trust you, to know you, and then to trust what you have revealed yourself to be, and then to walk in light of that. Help us to do that. It's hard, but it's what you have called us to do and enabled us to do in Christ. We thank you for that. We trust you. We thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen.